This is the Salzburg Outdoor Museum. As you can see, it's well and truly outdoors. It's well in the countryside. You've got to take a bus to get here on these long distance post buses. Well, not really long distance, but uh, not really city buses. So uh, that's what I mean by that. 180, and it stops here. And there's two of them every hour. I was lucky. I just turned up at the uh, station, and there was one there. It came in immediately. I didn't even have time to look for where it had to stop. This museum is over 50 hectares, so it's pretty big. And I'm not going to have a lot of time to see it because, as you can see, the afternoon is now advanced. I went to two other things this morning. This is part of the problem, if you like, with the Salzburg card. There's so much to do and see with it that you can't uh, really see it all. And uh, I really wanted to go on the boat this afternoon because there's a, a river cruise. And that's at three and four o'clock. And that bus is from Schonau am Königsee, where I was staying on the campsite last week. Now I know you get around here on the train, so the train seems as good an idea as any to kick off with. Advert for Coca Cola in 1921. Eighteen ninety eight timetable. As you can see, the train is included in the entry price. This railway station was in use from 1887 to 1928. It was a railway station used as a tourist destination on the side of the mountain and it was closed in 1928 because people uh, began to have cars, well those could afford to go there anyway, and uh, there wasn't really any longer much call for it, but it served a railway within the Cobb Railway. And it was rebuilt here as are all the buildings here. Now, um, two weeks ago, it was a place called the Museum of Tyrolean Farms, where the farm buildings were taken from all of Tyrol, saved some 500 years old, and very interesting. Station. Now this railway stop at Pongo was in use until not so long ago, until 2011. It was a railway station. Can I use that word station in this case? I don't know. It was in the Moor Valley, and then it was moved 400 metres when they uh, dug the railway line up in the 1970s, and it served as a bus stop. And it was brought here in 2011. Which makes me think, of course, that you know, the bus stops we used to take, well, one day, I hope, end up in museums like this.
the name sounded familiar, it's because they're the regions of the Salzburg area. So there we have it, flat cow, Salzburg, turning at Pongal to where we are now, so to speak. Capital, Sankt Johan. And that's how it's been divided. That's a stable from 1719. Looks quite luxurious in my opinion. Horses were the bottom, hay was kept at the top. And see this place here, sort of two uh, areas for the horses. One there and one on the other side. Here in Pongau, we've got all the buildings which are needed for an alpine farm, the residential house, the stable, the corn barn, flax roast barn, cabbage barrel, baking oven, and kitchen garden. That's a cabbage barrel used for sauerkraut and it was dug into the ground and that would protect it from the frost. And the wood is made out of uh, larch. Now it may seem like an alpine idyll, but it wasn't. A very tough life for people. Of course it was a tough life for just for everybody everywhere at that time and even tougher when overpopulation forced people to leave the countryside for the towns because the towns were making the farming implements and industrial revolution and so people left the land because of poverty found an even tougher situation when they got to the industrial centres. This harvesting machine dates from the 1930s. So while the government of the time, let's say the Nazi government, which was in fact from March 1938, was able to build tanks and uh, other weapons of warfare, farmers were still using things like this. It's a pity the uh, Imperial Austro-Hungarians hadn't thought about that instead of starting wars against Serbia, for example, like starting a war against Serbia. The money used in that would have funded a lot of farming. Much better idea, in my opinion.
that's a toilet from 1906 and it follows a plan for the Austrian or Austro-Hungarian Imperial Railways from around 20 years earlier and uh, so they've got urinal and you've got uh, the WC if you like, I don't think that's the right word to call it, uh, the, 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 the toilet and underneath it there was a cesspit and the cesspit had to be cleaned out manually. And here's a locomotive shed. Turned earlier the Cog Railway. In Gdansk, there was a place, this is now going back oh, to the about 1834, where there were these old steam engines. And uh, I remember there was a friend of mine sort of running up and down them. And, uh, very curious to see. I wonder what happened to those steam engines. In socialist Poland, they were in use all the time. In fact, they, I think they were only withdrawn in the 1990s. First time I saw a steam engine pulling a passenger carriage, I thought it was uh, rather weird. First time I saw one, I thought it was just sort of a museum sort of thing. Uh, not realising, of course, that steam engines were still in use in socialist Europe, well, in the 80s. Toll booth. The Grossglockner Road was completed in 1934 and it's one of the highest roads in Europe. It's still a popular route for tourism. It, it still is a toll road. I believe the cost is now 26 euros to use it. So for 26 euros, though, you are getting a lot of views <laughs> and things to see. Now, this was uh, one of the first toll booths on it. And you'd have a family who lived down below who would collect the toll. And upstairs, you'd have uh, sleeping accommodation for people who were workers on uh, seasonal people and what have you. There was no electricity, so the pumps, that's why there's this thing there too pump by hand. I've actually spoken to people who actually pump things by hand and uh, in, other, in other countries, for example in Italy, the price per litre is there you go, 407 shillings per litre and I think, I can't quite recall, I think it's like 10 to 12 uh, shillings is not the euro, so it's like 25-30 cents a litre, something along those lines. There you are, that's 448 there. So that one could be diesel and that one could be petrol. And so this is at 1868 metres. Now the highest road in Europe is 2730, if I remember rightly. It's in France, it's a military road. I took it once, very, very curious, very interesting. And things are high, it's going to get blocked with snow quite often. So something like that's now used. Record year was 1975. This year didn't snow much until last week. And the toll was paid not by vehicle but by person. That's quite unusual. I had it suggested to me that I would try 
on this journey, uh, this um, tour of the Gross Glockner, but I think I'll, uh, I'll give it a miss. The mill dates to 1847. It was used until 1970, although in the latter stages of its life it was only used for the rough grinding of cattle fodder. One of the arguments put forth for obesity today, and this is I'm using Dr. Jason Fung's argument here, is that in using modern methods of grinding that is that the, it flour is just like a fine dust, which means it's easily absorbed, very quickly absorbed into the body. And therefore, bread is a major source of obesity. Having said that, there's another argument. I can't quite recall the person who came up with it, his name now, but he's come up with evidence that people in ancient Egypt also had problems with obesity and diabetes that's because you can do examination of mummies and you can see fat people in hieroglyphics and uh, the models and things that they used. Therefore, and the, the, what they would be doing, very rough ground. In fact, they used to even add sand to it to sort of help them grind up the flour. And adverts have been found, for example, saying things like, don't buy Alan's bread, it's all full of sand. Two arguments there on bread, but both of them point to a reason why you shouldn't eat bread. I like bread. I like it a lot. But whole meal bread, using the whole grain, is not much better than the white stuff. charcoal making hut. That's the fire station. So fire engines could be kept in there and they started to be kept in places like that even in sort of the mid-19th century. Of course, we weren't motorised until the 20th century. But why do they always have a tower? I've just found out why. It's so that the pipes could be, the hoses, those pipes, could be dried after use. They'd, be, they'd hang them up in there and let them dry. That's the Maypole, I think. Today's the 2nd of May, so it might have been used yesterday. <laughs> 